makes it makes a lot of sense when you hear the stories about the Anzac soldiers, like the light horse. It's like, well, they were just from farms. That's right. They were just good stock. And you, you reminded me of the um, back in 2019, I had friends visit me from Victoria. They were farmers, generational farming, and they were here to here for a funeral for another. Uh, you know, um, they, they they said to me, oh, another 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 farmer committing suicide. Like it's just the norm. It's just like how how are we allowing this to happen? And and you're right about this monopoly. Maybe I'm using the wrong word. Maybe oligopoly between Coles and Woolies. Mm. The idea that this farm gate price that's negotiated, the price that these farmers pay. You gave the example of pineapples for for thirty cents or whatever, and that the you know them being sold for five six dollars or whatever it is at Coles or Woolies. Why is it? Why is it? What's going on there? And again, this isn't me going after Coles or Woolies. I just want to understand why. I want to actually set up an app if I have the opportunity to, or some kind of website where farmers can send us anonymously the farm gate price they're selling to these organizations and then we are finding exactly what they're being sold at around the country well, that's right if you look at the the milk like they they went after dairy farmers you know well let's 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 buy our own milk mm. let's undercut all our competition in the store mm. and put them out of business and you look at it and go how unethical is this practice yeah this is not you you're not talking about a t-shirt or you know um a car or something like that. You're talking about things that are sustaining human life in this country. Mm. You can't, you cannot allow that to happen. And it's time for governments to step up, put their money where their mouth is and legislate against this stuff. Mm. Legislate for fair pricing. The, and I'm talking at the gate. The farmer gets way more in their pocket for what they produce, but the end sale to the consumer can't be an extortionate price. And I'm not talking about, you know, taking away free market. We're not about that. You always could have free market. But if you... Do not have regulations to protect farmers. Yeah. You know, you've got to have something there as a safety net for them. And also another safety net you've got to have, you've got to have funds for them for when crops don't work, mm. when they have droughts, when things unexpected happen. And people from the bush are very proud people, very hardworking. They don't want a handout. They'll never take a handout. But this isn't a handout. This is um, their money that they've paid in tax over many years and all the hard work they've done feeding our kids and feeding our country we should be going after them and going, we've got a fund here for you. If you have a bad crop, we'll still make sure your, your farm's taken care of, you've still got money in your pocket, and you looked after the community of people looking after our farmers, you know? Mm. My question is, what sort of government uses our taxpayer dollars to fund our farmers to not farm mm. so that in three years' time we have no food? This is our government that we're paying our tax dollars to to ensure that three years down the track we do have grain stored to eat. What, this, the joke's on us. It really is. The joke is on us that they're using our taxpayer dollars to pay farmers to not farm. Mm. <laughs> this yeah. world yeah. is just bizarre. Yeah, you're right about that tragic element that the, 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 of the Australian farmer. I mean, Australia was built on the back of farmers and, and everything Australia has ever sort of put its hand to in terms of farming, it has more or less produced the best in the world, whether that is wool, whether that is fruit, whether that is vegetables, everything our farmers have done have not just been world class, but pretty much the best that you can get anywhere in the world. Uh, they're a part of our national. They're as much a part of our of our heritage and our legacy as are the Anzacs. And, and what is happening to them? It really is. It's a national disgrace, and it's an act of of sort of um, national treachery on the part of political parties that have allowed things like that to happen. Political parties that allow our farmers to go under, putting us at the mercy of massive um, global corporations who own millions of acres of tracts of land in other countries from where we wind up getting our fruit and vegetables now. And you all, you all see it at the, at the, uh, the supermarkets. You, 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 buy, uh, you buy a nectarine or something like that, and you know it's not going to ripen because it was frozen at one point. It's come over, and basically it's hard when you get it, and after about a week it's basically rotten. Um, and it's not the only thing that governments have allowed to happen in that respect. Um, it's also the housing prices issue. It's also the immigration issue. Uh, th these are literally acts of of government treachery. Uh, how does it happen? I think there are many ways that it happens. I think political parties are beholden to massive donors who uh, are themselves funded by these massive 
global corporations who own all this land, who are essentially trying to uh, gain monopolies on everything. And very often the language that they use to justify moving farming out of one particular country to elsewhere is they'll say, oh, it can be done more sustainably and more efficiently elsewhere. So it kind of becomes linked to the climate hoax. Mm. Um, And that the idea of sort of the climate crisis has such a group think pull and domination among national elites that it's almost irresistible and it's almost impossible to say, well, hold a second, wait a second, what about our national industry? The, re- the response is always, oh, we're in a global crisis, though. Now, how can you respond to that? Uh, so, I mean, that, that's part of the problem. But uh, as, as so, sort of someone who's interested in, in history and, and politics, What really worries me is that once our farmers lose the capacity, well, basically, once we lose our farmers, we become entirely dependent on other countries and on global corporations to get the things that we need literally to live. We become essentially vassals of global corporations, and and it's already happening now. And if you want to read something fantastic on this, Joel Kotkin, an American demographer, has written on this, and he says we're entering into a new feudal age where basically what is happening is we are becoming peasants again. We are becoming vassals. We're becoming peasants again, owning less and less and less. And the things that we need are things that we can no longer grow ourselves or get from people from our own uh, sort of broad up in our own country, we become reliant on faceless, massive corporations over whom we have absolutely zero control. That is where, in worst case scenario, we're heading. Yeah, sorry guys, I've got, I got some scatterbrain shots I've got to fire out just real quick. First off, tyranny of the majority. If you look at this map here, this shows you exactly the problem with this, because the farm is obviously rurally based. We've got about eight or nine rural electorates in New South Wales out of about 40. So the other 30 that are there are all in inner Sydney right here, which is all zoomed in right here. This is a problem because they will never be able to get enough votes in order to actually do what they need to do. So if we don't actually start making more states, for example, if we don't actually um, keep the farmers in mind and hear their consultation, the people in the city that where it's trendy to uh, act as if they live out of reality and they don't actually have to listen to what the farmers are saying, the people that keep us fed, you've never been on the farm, most people in the city. You have no idea. Now, I was very lucky. I went to a school where there was uh, 30, 40% of the schools were, were boarding students from farming backgrounds because um, I went to I went to King's and I saw these farming guys. They'd come from all over the country and it gave me a healthy dose of the perspective of Aussies. Um, of course, some in the cities as well. But the other thing is these generational farms, they're generational farms because they're sustainable in their nature. Whereas they get, they, they, they make them sound like these, these farmers that they're just, you know, raping and pillaging the land. It's like, well, then there's nothing to hand your kids. These are like eight generations of farming sometimes. Um, and the last thing I'll say on this, Australia has one of the worst monopolies in the world with coals and woolies. One of the worst. Um, when you compare it to other countries, even America. And um, the problem with that is if we don't work out how to actually have a truly competitive market, because the left will say, oh, you know, the progressives will say, well, this is capitalism's fault. It's like, no, no, this is not capitalism. This is like a, a monopoly that is entrenched by government policy as well. Anyway, there's a lot of things I want to do on this particular topic, guys, but I could talk about this forever. I would love to do some kind of a project. I've got the guys to do it. I just lack the information. If you could send it to me, what farm gate price a farm is sending um, their produce to Coles and Woolies? I have no doubt many of them will have some kind of an NDA. That's the challenge with these things. But I think it'd be fascinating. I think it'd be really fascinating. Um, anyway, um, moving on, I have a really interesting topic which we haven't talked about specifically, being digital ID. So 